technology. Uh, my, I'm going to have three people talk in the next hour or so uh, about specific parts and, and topics of, of a cross reference from a technical perspective. My slide is titled the System Update. That's a little bit of an overstatement. I'm really going to focus on, on, on two topic areas and with a smattering of a little bit of other stuff here and there, but primarily I'm going to focus on just these two, two areas. Um, just to start off with, uh, this, this past year or so, we, we really reached a fairly nice level of stability with the operations of the system. I think our infrastructure is, is rounded out quite nicely now. We're on, a, on a, I think a, a much nicer, much more stable footing uh, for really the operation of things. And um, the, uh, the availability and the performance of the system reflects this now. I think we've seen some uh, uh, fairly significant usage storms hit us in the past several months, and we've come through those uh, very nicely. So uh, quite, right now, I'm, I'm quite happy with the way that the, the system is operating from a performance and stability point of view. And another nice thing about stability is that we have less time spent fighting fires and more time now to actually work on the, the good stuff, the fun stuff, and spend a little bit more time uh, working on things in a, in a measured way. So this, these are all good things in terms of the development of the maturity of, of the system and its infrastructure. So just in general, a couple of things that I want to just mention, this is just sort of out of the blue, different things. Uh, we started accepting abstracts in our deposits last year. And so these are abstracts using the JAX, the Journal Archive Tagging Set, uh, DTD, or schema. And so you can, uh, you can include the abstracts with the metadata when you deposit it to Crossref. Now, We've received probably about 60,000 EOIs with abstracts right now. It might be still in the uh, trial stages for some folks, but uh, basically just want to get the word out that, uh, that abstracts are now are permitted in the deposit. Uh, the reason you want to really do that is we're more and more in the business of distributing metadata via various mechanisms. Um, and so a lot of uh, organizations are coming to Crossref to pull the metadata if your metadata includes abstracts, that's only going to make that data more valuable. And so um, it's, a, it's a good conduit for you to get distribution of, of the metadata for your articles and your other content. Uh, just to mention, well, there's different ways to talk to Crossref technically. Um, these are all uh, documented in various places, but and they all sort of complement each other, uh, targeted at different Usage profiles, different their users uh, have a different view of how they want to access the data, what their, what their systems look like. And so th these four things are kind of the primary uh, viewpoints, both the you know, old word portal, but into the, the Crossref system and, and, uh, and, the, and the data behind it. Okay, so now I'm going to dive into one of the topics that I want to talk about. Being able to read the slide this isn't necessarily important. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go through the, the points that I want to make on it. Um, as is sometimes the case, I pick on a member uh, who's, who has done something that isn't quite right and it, uh, it, it exemplifies a problem that we have encountered and are having to deal with. And my apologies go out to the writer ahead of time. I stumble on a DOI of yours that, uh, that talks to the illustrates the point that uh, I want to talk about, and that is uh, conflicts. Uh, conflicts are a situation that we've confronted for a long, long time, and in the past, we primarily depended on our making known to the membership that there are conflicts, and we expect the member to do something about it, to resolve the problem. And what is a conflict? Well, here you have two DOIs, two, the metadata for two DOIs. And if you could see, or you have really good eyes, you would notice that this metadata looks remarkably similar for the two DOIs. Um, this is basically a conflict. So uh, what happened in this case, I found out from Patricia later on, that uh, a degrader changed platforms. They moved their content to a new platform, and they had a DOI that they had deposited back in, that doesn't 
the same era. I think it was like 2009, something like that. And then they have another DOI that was deposited in 2014 that done the new platform. Two DOIs, same metadata, basically a problem. Uh, here's a little bit of information, a little bit of uh, behind the scenes metadata that relates to these DOIs, and it points out a couple of the problems. Uh, the DOI in the bottom uh, was created on, uh, okay, it was last updated on 2013, uh, in July 2013. And this, this metadata talks to some things that describe, this is kind of, kind of like meta metadata. One of the items on here is the cited by count. And you can see in this older DOI that the cited by count is, is 23. Okay. When the coordinator then came along and deposited yet another DOI with the same metadata, creating a conflict, thus a really a duplicate, we've got the one on the top. And you can see that it has a cited by count of four. So this article, which is really one and the same article, now has two pieces of metadata. One has a cited by count of four, one has a cited by count of 23. That's wrong. Okay. So uh, the, the cited by value of this article is now suffering from the fact that two DOIs split that, that content, that metadata. Uh, this is one of the reasons why we really don't like to uh, let, com let conflicts uh, exist for long, and we put together all kinds of reports uh, that go out to the membership to say, please pay attention to this and resolve it. Uh, so this conflict situation has existed since January of 2014. Okay. So I know you can't really see this well, but uh, these are, this is the landing page that these two DOIs go to, and you can see that. Uh, up on the left-hand side is a site that has an image of the first page or so of the article on it. Um, that's what that platform is obviously presenting. Uh, this page down here looks a little bit different. Basically all the same kind of metadata, titles, authors, all that kind of stuff is, is the same. The marginalia on the left side is all the same between the two articles. This one has a textual abstract on it. All right. But I looked this over really closely, and both of these pages are the exact same article. They're just different platforms, um, and obviously two different DOIs. And now you've seen the, the problem that that can, can surface. So this is a snippet of the report that we make available. We try to run it up the flag in front of people as often as we can get people's attention to, to look at this stuff. And, and basically, it's a little bit cryptic, it's a little bit geeky, but it's basically giving you all the information that says, you know, these two DOIs, and you can see them pretty clearly there, a little bit different syntax or styling to the suffix between these two DOIs. Not quite sure what, what BC versus BCHM differentiates, uh, but that's, that's their, their styling. And the metadata is the same for, this, for these two DOIs. You can, you can see that clearly right here. So this is the report that we put out that said, please do something about this. Um, so what happens when, when this condition exists? So there's, there's a number of ways that you, you talk to Crossref and that people are interested in dealing with Crossref. Um, and one of those ways the, the, going back to the very beginnings of Crossref was, I'm going to send in a query with metadata, and I'm going to, I expect to get back one DOI. Because I'm an automated system, and I'm talking to Crossref, I want the DOI for a specific article. So if I sent in a query like this, um, which says the author, the volume, uh, the ISSN, uh, the issue of the year, and there's no page for this article. It doesn't have one. It's just an online article, so they don't have a page. They never deposited the page number. That's the kind of query that comes in. And in the past, we would not know which one to return, because there was two. So we would return nothing. Now, we return the most recent one. 
we've basically, I've made a unilateral decision that we're going to come up with rules to try and return something rather than nothing. And so when you send in that query, you will get the DOI that is the most recent DOI that's owned by the grader who owns the title. That's basically the, the, the rule that's enforced here. The downside of this is you're getting back the metadata that has the cited by count of 4. And the cited by count of 23 is now lost to history, sort of. Um, that's a further part of the problem that we're going to solve. We're going to basically go on to blend these, this, this data together and merge it into one. Um, so, so this is primarily the change that we've made to the system to return a, a, a DOI. There are already cases where the, the former DOI may have been owned by a, a publisher who used to own the journal, but the journal was transferred in its ownership. The new publisher acquired this journal, and the rule is you're supposed to take the old DOIs and transfer them to you, to the new owner, and change the URL. Uh, sometimes, too often actually, uh, that doesn't happen. The new publisher goes ahead and assigns new DOIs with their prefix to everything that is already got a DOI, and now we have two DOIs with them. Same kind of problem. Uh, and so one of the rules here is if there are two DOIs and one is owned by someone who doesn't own the title, give them the one that is owned by the publisher that actually owns the title. So uh, again, it's a response to a condition where repair is not being affected by the members who deposited the metadata. We're, we're going to kind of jump in and try and fix that. So that's, that's what we've already done. But as I said, just giving back a DOI is not necessarily the end of the story. There's, there's more issues to be concerned with. So here's a, a screenshot of Prospect Metadata Search. Uh, I went in, I, I, I put in the article title, and I get back what? Back to the ones. And you can see that they are listed in, in a, you know, at the top of the results list. Same metadata, same, uh, you know, very, you can't distinguish between the two. And, and this happens to be the, the newer one, listed second. Okay? So, yes, I'm a person, I'm looking at this, I can decide what to do, but it's not helpful to have two DOIs both from the same publisher pointing to this. Content. So that's a problem. <coughs> Another problem is there's a slightly different way of querying against Crossref. You can send in uh, just the author and the, and the article title. And, and this interface returns the other DLI, the old one. So this, this is actually a bug that's going to be fixed. Uh, actually, it's going to be fixed by what I'm going to tell you in a moment. So what are we going to do? We are going to automatically process all unresolved conflicts and, and, and try to uh, resolve them. Pick, pick the right one, um, make that EOI the prime, which essentially uh, deprecates the other the other DOIs. It'll merge the metadata properly and, and even the meta metadata properly so that there is uh, one accurate reflection. Um, there are about 473,000 DOIs currently in unresolved conflicts. The case that I'm pointing out here is actually a rather simple one to resolve because it's very clear. Uh, there are cases where DOIs are in, there are many, many, many DOIs involved in a conflict, and it's really not a conflict. It's either the, the, the DOIs are pointing to uh, content that is what we do. So often, there's no author, uh, there's no, um, the article title is the same as book review, and there's no real way of distinguishing. So those things are, shouldn't really be in conflict because they're just DOI standing on their own. Um, that com confounds the situation, we, and we will be dealing with that correct, correctly. Um, so that's a little bit of my rant on conflicts. Uh, this, this is a, a bit of a serious problem for us. And, uh, this is how we're addressing it. The other thing I want to talk about is uh, web callback. Um, 
this is the way that most people, the most uh, most people's workflow is uh, looks like this with regard to positing metadata. Uh, so you, you know, generate an XML file, you deposit it by posting it to the, the system, and it goes into the queue, and the queue processes it, and the job is done. And what happens next is the system sends out an email. And this is the way it's built in 2002, and it's sort of pretty well for a long time. Um, and actually, a lot of people still like this approach, and it's not going to go away. Um, and so an email gets sent that contains the log file. Those logs can be large. Uh, an email is not exactly the most uh, reliable way to send this kind of information. Uh, but it, it works pretty good. It has its deficiencies. Um, and here are some of the problems that we've encountered over the years. Uh, early on, we were blacklisted on a lot of mail servers as spammers <laughs> because we produced so much email. Solves some of those problems, but this is uh, this is the way it has always been done. Another way of doing it was the poll. There are a couple of bigger members who actually do it this way. They send in the deposit, um, and then they can send a request to the system saying, "Is it done yet?" And you keep doing that as often as you want to, asking, "Is it done yet?" You get a reply back saying, "I'm working on it," and eventually you get a reply back that says, "It's done," and here's the log file. So polling. Is, uh, is a reasonable way of going about it. It's a little bit tedious, does involve some issues, uh, but it, 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 for many people, it's better than email. So, the new way is web callbacks. Um, essentially, you build an endpoint, you have to build a web service someplace on your site, and that's the point we're going to call, and we'll set up that endpoint uh, in our system. That's, your, that's the phone home number for you. So when a deposit gets made and the log file is ready, we will send a URL a request to your endpoint that will contain this information, which tells you uh, the, the submission ID, the log file, the, the file that you sent in, the name of the file, the batch ID, and a URL where to come and get the results. And so now, no more polling, no more mailboxes getting filled up, uh, you can just get results via this information once you've received the, um, the callback. And there are ways to query the callback interface to say, uh, did I miss any callbacks? Or well, what, what callbacks have, have been issued in the past you know, two weeks? So that in case your service actually went down and we couldn't, you didn't answer the phone when we called, um, you can query the system back again to find out what this what were the list of callbacks that we attempted to make and whether or not they were successful or not. Uh, so you, you, can, you can backfill things if they get lost. So web callbacks is my second major topic that I want to talk about. Um, conflicts and web callbacks. And uh, web callbacks are not just for deposit in XML. They're also <laughs> available for forward link alerts. Uh, forward link alerts really was the, the big uh, culprit in terms of putting us on spammers list because there's a lot of email going on. Uh, we, we, we implemented aggregated forward link alerts a couple of years ago where we collect them through the course of the day and you get uh, two emails a day at most. Uh, the cron job runs twice and it will send out one email with an aggregation of all the forward link alerts that have happened in the last 12 hours. So at least that way you only get two emails instead of getting thousands. Or even more. Um, but you can use web callbacks for forward link alerts. Same thing will happen. You will get a web callback twice a day, and the, the URL that you go to get the data will contain the same aggregated set that you would have gotten via email. Okay. Uh, so it, it's, it's, it's a little bit more of a reliable way to interface with the system. And also, uh, batch query jobs. People upload queries, um, and they have them run asynchronously to their request, and they're sometimes very large. Um, so web callbacks can also be used for well, batch query jobs that get run. OK, just an, a quickie a web deposit form. This, this form is actually amazingly resilient. Uh, it, I, I'm, there's a lot of people that use it. It's a little bit antiquated, but it seems to be quite effective. You know, people basically will come to this, this page, 
So cycle through the, the a sequence of forms, entering in the metadata for an article that they want to deposit the metadata for, because they don't want to build XML, and um, it, it creates the deposit for them uh, on the fly. Sort of. um, still in, in use, it continues to expand. Uh, we now have an NLM file uh, beta, where if you have an XML file built according to the NLM DTD, and it contains everything that you, um, all the metadata that's in there, you can just upload that file. And we'll extract out of it uh, all the per metadata for author and all that kind of stuff and create the deposit that way. So that's, that's, a, that's a, a nice uh, shortcut to populating these fields. And there's also a supplemental metadata upload option where you can build a spreadsheet that contains uh, fund ref information or, or uh, license information and upload that in, in one shot and basically populate that against all of the DOIs that are affected by that metadata. It's, a, it's a, just a shortcut to being able to add this kind of metadata to a lot of DOIs that already exist. And if you don't want to redeposit the full metadata for those DOIs, this is a handy little backdoor to getting that kind of information in. Next thing that I'll just uh, I'll finish with is uh, uh, I'll talk about relations. Um, there's a lot of uh, relations that we already handle, have already have, have always implicitly dealt with in the metadata. You know, uh, who authored an article? That's a relationship between two entities, uh, but it's captured in the metadata in a very in a very explicit way uh, in, in, in the deposit. Um, what we're basically going to be adding in is a general is that a generalized look at how to add relationships between DOIs and other things. And, and this will this will permit the uh, deposit of a DOI to mention or claim that it affects or is affected by something else. And that something else may be another DOI, uh, a DOI cross rep, a DOI that's not a cross rep, or something that's identified via some other means. Okay? So relations are uh, happening now. Um, there, there still will be uh, dedicated ways of, of dealing with certain kinds of relationships, cited by, for example, uh, a good example of, of when you deposit your metadata, you create a citation list, you send that in, and that, uh, and that establishes the relationship between one article and another article, the cited by relationship. So that's how that's going to continue to be done. So this kind of just covers a little bit of what I, I, I spoke about. Um, we, that there are going to be emerging uh, new uh, specific treatments that will happen. Uh, linked clinical trials uh, is, is one name for it. I think it was also known by, what was the other name we called that before? Pardon? Threat of publications. Threat of publications, yeah. So this, this is just something new that's, that, that, that's coming on the scene now. It's, it's clearly a way to establish a relationship between something and something else, um, but it's targeted. And then it's going to be done in a specific way, not using the generalized relationship structure. Okay. Uh, that's all. I, I think we'll hold questions.